Tom as we say good morning to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, two-star. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here as always. Wonderful to have you, Bill. Well, thank you. You're very kind. How did your strategic planning meeting go yesterday? It was, uh, I think it's productive. Did you strategically plan? We planned. You're going to ask, did I make any comments? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was a good meeting. How many and, hours would you say you invested in that yesterday? Uh, we we're, I think, six hours. But they feed us well, and they it's well organized. It's That's not good. just uh, uh, kind of fumbling around. Uh, uh, not like this show at all, then, is what you're saying. <laughs> there is a contrast, Rob. <laughs> I'll get on that, Admiral. I'll get on that. Also, let's say good morning to the Sarge, Michael Hike. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Great to be here. Beautiful weather today. Wonderful to have you. Yes. What did you do to yourself up there? Uh, you know, I got... I get hit in the head with a can of soda. <laughs> Sorry, you, it will you elaborate on that, Mike? Well, it didn't hurt because it was a soft drink. <laughs> ah, boom, boom, <laughs> but, um, boom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> was that while playing pool with one of your buddies? The guy uh, mad, uh, angry? No, with you? no, no. I had a good night at pool last night. Yeah. Um, I lost, so it wasn't real good. But um, it, it was. It's good hanging out. My sons all play with me, so yeah. it's good hanging out with my kids. But you know, you it. You cannot just pass off this injury, and it looks like a pretty serious injury to your head, as just because of soft drink. You got there has to be a cause behind it, Mike. Well, it actually, I had some kind of uh, uh, growth or something. Up there. Oh, had, a, the doctor cut it out. So a soft drink sounds more yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah, soft drinks much more <laughs> exciting. My, yes. my first guess Medical. was that it was some type of skin cancer yeah. thing, and then when you said the soft drink, it totally threw me for a loop. <laughs> Well, he had Mike, the punchline ready to go. Yeah, uh, Mike's good. Mike's good. He he well, virtuous. He deflects. We <laughs> see that. <laughs> we see that with his issues on Friday morning. <laughs> Our guest in this uh, segment here to lead off the program is a former uh, roommate. Uh, I guess you guys shared office space your first year in the House of Delegates. Rick Hillenbrand out of the 88th Hampshire County. Delegate Hillenbrand joins us via telephone. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing well today. Thank you for uh, asking. Great to have you. What was it like sharing office space with Height and Hornby? <laughs> well, I think uh, we did pretty well. Get along well, uh, shared ideas, and uh, you know, helped each other along as all three of us were first termers simultaneously. So each of us was learning a little bit of uh, different information all along, and we shared it with each other. All right, uh, be honest now. Who is the messier of the two, Height or Hornby? Um. Gosh, I, I couldn't say. I, I might be in the running there, too, you know. <laughs> it was it was definitely height. Fair enough. Now, uh, uh, Rick, I, I understand you are a career Navy man and that uh, you and the Admiral here may share a few people in common. Yeah, so so uh, that's, that's a true statement. Um, uh, he also uh, did time with NOAA. Uh, I went to a Merchant Marine College in New York Maritime, and a lot of our alumni um, go into uniform services, whether it's the Navy or Coast Guard, uh, NOAA as well, in addition to uh, serving in the Merchant Marine. Yeah, also you went to uh, SUNY. I had a good friend who taught there for several years, and also MIT with Ocean Engineer, and I, I worked with yeah. that department some. So I, I suspect we do know some folks in common, Rick. Well, if you knew uh, uh, Koichi Masabuchi in Ocean Engineering, um, I think he was kind of an institution there. He was my thesis advisor. Actually, Chris Christoph Smitty is the one I was worked most closely with. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, know him as well. Yeah, very good. So, uh, Rick, yesterday I received a press release that says, says there's a new uh, grassroots organization that was launched to advocate for transparent, secure, and trustworthy elections across the state. West Virginians unite to form Citizens for West Virginia Election Integrity. And in the press release, you were quoted from that. Tell me about this organization and uh, why you felt it was necessary to uh, be a part of this. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Um, the, the, the title of the, or the name of the group is Self-Defining, Looking for Election Integrity. Uh, this is a group that uh, has been working for uh, a while includes people that have had professional uh, involvement in election integrity from inside government and outside government over the years. And this last session while we were uh, in the legislature, they met with a number of legislators uh, several times and expressed concerns with regards to voting integrity. And I think what caught my personal attention there was uh, 
the fact that, you know, they're looking to have what I think everybody would want, which is open, honest, and transparent elections. You know, who wants voter fraud? I can't, I can't think of a single person in their right mind that would say, I'm in favor of, you know, uh, multiple voting, whether it's intentional or accidental, or, you know, buying votes or ballot harvesting and all the rest of those types of things. So that group, continue to develop, continue to do research. Uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions out there, but along those lines, there were a number of members in the House and in the Senate that shared their concerns, and we've decided to uh, start a caucus, an election integrity caucus. We're in the formative stages there, and uh, as uh, my quote there basically says, we're uh, looking to make sure that our local and state governments are making sure that every vote cast in West Virginia is both legally valid, accurately recorded, and transparently audited. And, and I will say, I, I believe that our current Secretary of State, Mac Warner, has been working very hard to make sure that West Virginia is, I guess, becoming the gold standard in the country, and uh, I'm really happy about that. Uh, you go back uh, to the, the Kennedy-Nixon election of 1960, and the stories are uh, pretty full with uh, vote buying and uh, some integrity issues in terms of how the votes were uh, counted and even even cast in, in that uh, election there. So there is a history of that in this state, not that there isn't in other states too, but uh, certainly there's a pretty good history of it here in West Virginia. Your last comment about the Secretary of State, was there anything at all that had you concerned about the way the votes were counted in West Virginia in the most recent elections? I didn't have any specific ones that were brought to, to my attention immediately. However, there's a great reference out there, and I'll give this so your listening audience can go look for themselves. Uh, the Heritage Organization has a website, www.heritage.org slash voter fraud. If you go to that website, and it's got a really well-documented database there, you can look by state uh, with regards to what all's going on. And if you look in West Virginia, you'll find, hey, we're not immune. There are a couple pages worth of entries there, everything from duplicate and uh, uh, fraudulent uh, use of absentee ballots to um, – ineligible voting, people that uh, voted um, that are not citizens, to people that voted in multiple states. Not talking about dozens and dozens and dozens, but it happens. Um, I'm going to be charitable and say that I hope that the majority of these are accidental and unintentional, but um, I suspect that's probably being a little naive to think that none of it's not intentional. Admiral. Yeah, uh, Rick, I agree with you. Everybody wants to have confidence in our election process. Uh, I think most folks do have confidence in the election process, at least at the local level, uh, and then even at the state level. When you get to the national level, then that's where it starts falling apart. Uh, but have you, is this a problem that you're looking to make or do you think there's en enough pro uh, sufficient grounds in the state of West Virginia to make this a major issue? Yeah, I, I first off, I don't think we're looking to make a problem. I think what we're trying to do is instill confidence in the system. As you said, I don't think we really have a big issue, if one at all, in West Virginia. I'm going to harken back for a moment there uh, to my own election in 2022. It was a rather tight race. And uh, one of my opponents uh, decided to ask for a recount in some of the districts. So we did a recount. It's a tedious process if you've never gone and done that and sat there and uh, tried to not doze off as we manually looked at every one of those ballots and they're projected up on a screen and, you know, you're putting little tick marks and all the rest of that. But at the end, and this is the part, as the county clerk said, the numbers that were tabulated and reported initially and the recount exactly matched, which is important 
because it does give the voters some confidence that the system isn't miscounting through machine errors or any of the rest of those types of things. So that's the first part. The, the next part is we are looking, and uh, there are some other delegates that are very actively involved with trying to uh, research our, our own equipment here in West Virginia, just to, again, provide that confidence. And we haven't found anything specifically that we can say, aha, Here's a smoking gun that looks like something's funny. Um, I, I think a lot of us have gotten to the point in our technological age here where we understand we've got this black box, whatever black box it is, whether it's your cell phone or a voting tabulator, and we don't know what goes on inside those black boxes. And the best example I can give was uh, I was given a thumb drive oh, about – I don't know, 10 years ago when I was a newly um, elected member to one of the uh, regional Boy Scout boards. And on that thumb drive was supposed to be all the documents and stuff that I might need in that new role. But I had somebody scan that thumb drive before I plugged it into my machine because the thumb drive said made in China. And lo and behold, buried deep below where I wouldn't find stuff was malware. So... You know, you don't know what you don't know. That's the part that I think concerns a lot of people. Yeah, uh, picking up on a couple of your points, I had a similar situation when I was elected county commissioner years or so ago, and the result was the same. After two days of very tedious hand counting, the numbers were within one or two or three votes, which was uh, well within the margin of error. So I echo what you say. There's a lot of a lot of foundation uh, for for acceptance. Uh, the second thing is uh, the machines that we use uh, are different than the thumb drives that you pick up at the local uh, uh, Walmart. Uh, these machines are scrutinized, examined very closely uh, by the state, uh, Secretary of State's office, and to some degree by the county. So it's not going to be as easy, casual to get malware in as what you have in your local thumb drive. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, in fact, Delegate um, Erica Moore had the opportunity, uh, working with one of her local, local county commissioners and uh, the ESS folks, to open up a machine, break the steel. Uh, again, ESS was there and verify that, hey, everything was uh, like it should be and there wasn't any funny business going on inside the machine, either inside the sealed component or inside the part that you would open and be able to access to when you just lift the cover. So, uh, again, that's reassuring. Um, I'm sure there are people out there that say, okay, so that was one, but until you check them all, you don't know. I, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I'm not going to go say, yeah, that was a plant and all the rest are bad, and that was the only good one. Mike Height, a member of the legislature, is uh, this something that would appeal to you as a delegate uh, co-sponsoring a bill, for instance? Well, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I think the, the general public wants to know that our elections are fair and honest. Nobody's trying to cheat the system. Um, but we have seen in the past, uh, and, and most recently here in West Virginia, in Mingo County, where there was a huge anomaly, and they did have to go back and, and hand count, and they did find... Um, I won't say fraud, but I, I will say it was fraud. Uh, well, yeah, yeah people yeah. were voting where they weren't sh supposed to be voting. Um, so it does happen. It happens here in West Virginia. Um, and and I think the general public wants to know uh, that we are doing all we can as legislators, as county commissioners, um, as as elected officials to make sure that this fraud is is stamped out and if that means you know getting together a, a, an organization uh like the one that's been formed here and to ask the hard questions and have them answered on a regular basis then i think that's a good thing i think that goes a long way to um, making the public feel uh, assured that this isn't some kind of third world country and, and, and that the election process is fair, it's balanced, and that the vote I cast or the vote they cast is the actual vote that shows up 
on the the computer screen um, at the end of the day. So uh, I don't have a problem with this at all, and I'd I'd certainly be willing to vote for legislation, depending on how it was crafted. I I don't want to ever vote for a legislation unless I read it. Um, But depending on how it was crafted, I would definitely support some legislation to make sure that uh, the election process here in West Virginia is fair and honest. Mike, before you go, and a question for Rick, actually, based on what Mike just said. Uh, Rick, what procedures are you proposing? Is this going to be, is this going to be just uh, a, uh, a document that says we encourage? Is this going to actually give instructions or, uh, to the Secretary of State, to the county commissions, or is it going to be having boots on the ground at each election, uh, uh, each election? office to ensure that integrity has been pursued how, how do you propose to to implement what you're seeking to do? and if i could piggyback onto yeah. that bill will this be an unfunded mandate from yeah. the state down to the local governments or will it be funded if that's necessary yeah. good point yep so uh, the the effort of the caucus presently is to look at legislation that we want to uh, bring forth uh, consolidate uh, the number of bills that are out there, add some that weren't there. I'll give you an example. Uh, I went through with a few other members of the legislature, both the House and the Senate, oh, how many pages here? Five pages of bills. And this is just listing of the, the bill number, short title, and the current status that were in the last regular session in 2024. Uh, a number of those bills are very similar, so we want to consolidate them. Uh, some of the bills were really not applicable uh, to voting integrity. It was more of a procedural type thing, so we won't, won't work on forwarding those. But we want to consolidate and reintroduce those bills and, uh, you know, see if we can get them passed into legislation. So some of those things would do things like uh, clean voter rolls in um, uh, areas uh, where there are colleges, for instance. We want to make sure that we can get the colleges to uh, work with us to bounce their local voting roles with where uh, their dormitories are and things like that, make sure that we don't have college students that are registered, say, uh, in Morgantown and also voting back home. Um, Voter uh, IDs um, with regards to voter roles and uh, uh, giving the... uh, people at the poll watching, the ability to match an individual with a, a photograph there and uh, those types of things. Uh, with regards to unfunded mandates, I don't see that being an unfunded thing as opposed to something that would be a part of uh, the Secretary of State's uh, normal operating budget. So the Secretary of State would effectively, out of his own budget provided by the legislature, make sure that any local governments that have to spend money to enforce whatever legislation comes down is indeed funded. Yeah, I can't say that 100% across the board, obviously. Uh, you don't know exactly what all bills will, will get there, but, but things specifically like voter ID and those types of things, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's not very hard, and uh, it's mostly you know, just matching up information that's already available from uh, the Secretary of State's office, the county clerks and DMV. And uh, again, and I'm sure you guys have voted at some point in time and you go there and you, you see the poll watcher, you know, looks up in the book and finds your name and verifies your address. And sometimes they may even ask for some form of identification to match it up that it is who you say you are and go from there. What's missing there is how do I know that you're really that person if my registration doesn't have, you know, a little photo printed there that looks like you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rick, secondary to this is voter turnout. It's a lot easier to manipulate an election when there's low voter turnout. And we have extremely low voter turnout, especially in primary elections in this part of the state, at least anyway, Berkeley County. uh, Jefferson does better than Berkeley, but it's by no means something to brag about. Is there anything the legislature can do to increase voter turnout, whether that be funded public service campaigns of getting out the vote or I, something else that's an incentive? I am so glad you raised that question. In fact, I'm going to put Delegate Height on the on the spot a little bit here, too, because 
I'm going to propose, and maybe he'd join me, that we make it a state holiday to vote on Election Day. You know, remove that excuse for for a lot of people, maybe not 100 percent of the people, but remove the excuse that, hey, I can't go out and vote because I got to work or whatever. I, I think most employers actually do what they can to encourage people to vote. But here, let's let's remove any obstacle because there are people that I get it, that commute a long ways to go to work and maybe work long shifts, et cetera. So that's one idea that I've got that I'd like to propose in our next regular session. And again, maybe Delegate Height and others will uh, join me in that. No, I, <laughs> I don't want to rain on your parade. I'm I'm sort of an old fashioned type person when it comes to voting. It it is it's not a right. It's a privilege. And if you don't take advantage of that privilege, shame on you. Um, we have early voting. We have given the the general public opportune time, plenty of opportune time to go out and vote. They can vote on Election Day. Um, they can vote beforehand. Uh, there's lots of places open uh, to, to do the early voting now, especially here in, in Berkeley County. And we still had a low ver- voter turnout. Um, and And... It's not because we have not made the voting uh, available at, at appropriate times. Um, it is it is on the people. You know, you you have that privilege. Go out and exercise the privilege um, and and quit I, I bitching and complaining you. about what happens when you don't go out and vote. Yeah, I agree with you. It is a privilege, and I don't understand why people don't vote. Um, whether they're disenfranchised or they're lazy, I just don't get it. Um, I, I wish we had much higher voter turnout. And the initial observation that it is so low, it, it makes you wonder why. And and I'm not – and nothing against Rick. Rick, if you run the, the legislation, you know, great. Um, but I'm not giving people a day off to go <laughs> exercise their privilege <laughs> – you know, no, figure yeah, it out. It, there is early there, voting. There is early morning voting. There is late in the evening voting. I don't want to hear it. I Get knew, your butt to the polls. I knew he'd be against it, Rick. I, could t- I could told you that before that set was finished. Uh, by the way, Matt Harvey, who's the Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, is listening, and he says there's already a law that allows employees to vote without penalty by the employer. Yeah, Um The other thing, too, with that bill, and I realize there's a cost associated with that. Anytime you say, oh, we're going to give people another state holiday, you know, there's a cost associated with that. And I'm sure you are well aware we're a balanced budget state. So if it's going to cost money, you know, where's that coming from or what are you cutting? Rick, we are out of time. I appreciate yours. Thank you so much for joining us this morning on the program. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Enjoy it. thank, Thank you for having me. You guys have a great day. You too.